This is IDG1030. At first glance, he doesn't seem very special. But here's what's interesting about him. In 2001, he took part in a special research project on longevity. It was led by Dr. Richard Miller, a research expert in the biology of aging at the University of Michigan. By the time he died, he might have been the world's oldest living mouse at four years old. So what was his secret? Look closely at these two mice, and you'll quickly notice something weird. Yeah, one of them is abnormally small, like freakishly small. Both this guy and IDG1 are snail mice, a mutant strain of mouse that lives much longer than usual. The mutation that makes these mice snelly is the change of a single nucleotide on a gene called PIT1, which plays a crucial role in the formation of the pituitary gland. If you recall from anatomy class, you may remember that the pituitary gland is that clump of tissue in your brain that stimulates growth and development. By stopping normal function of the pituitary gland, snail mice don't ever grow very big. In fact, snail mice in adulthood only weigh a third as much as normal mice do. For scale, that's as much as a handful of paperclips weighs. So how does being so small help them live so much longer? Here's where it gets tricky. On one hand, we know that their bodies seem much healthier in age. Take the fact that the collagen stores and their muscles and bones depletes noticeably slower, or that they die far less frequently of cancer. And trust my word when I'm describing this image, their healthy fat composition when compared to normal mice is superior. Here's the thing though, we're not exactly sure what's causing these differences in snail mice to appear. Sure. There's the odd pathway here and there that looks different between snail mice and normal mice. But like anything in science, it's difficult to determine causality. All we know is that they live longer, and healthier for longer. At this point, you and I are probably asking the same exact thing. On three. One, two, three. How do I take out my pituitary gland so I can live longer? No? Okay, well I asked Richard Miller anyway. Well, um, we're interested in things that might have a clinical benefit in people. Changing the genes of babies so they'll be dwarfs and live a long time is not practical in any, any real sense. It, it's a non-starter except in science fiction stories. What people want, and quite correctly, and what we want is a pill. Uh, generally, if you want to prevent a disease, you use an immunization or you use a pill. And that's why we're studying pills. That's right, a pill. Dr. Miller co-leads the Interventions Testing Program, the ITP. This study, supported by the National Institute on Aging, is trying to find medicines that help mice, and eventually people, live longer. In 2009, the ITP published their first paper on an organ transplant drug called rapamycin. They found that it extends lifespan in mice by around 10 to 15%. And since then, they've discovered half a dozen other drugs that also extend lifespan. And in recent years, they've even started testing combinations of drugs. By putting two different drugs together, they independently knew extended lifespan. Rapamycin and another one called Acarbos. They were able to extend lifespan in mice by up to 30%, more than neither of them could do alone. Wait a minute, 30%? That's insane. It almost sounds too good to be true. So let's poke some holes in it. For one, we know that these drugs don't work the same for every mouse. That combo that extended lifespan by 30%, it actually only did so in male mice, who started treatment at 9 months, which is middle age for a mouse. For female mice, where mice started at 16 months, old age for a mouse, Acarbos didn't add any extra lifespan benefit, on top of the ones already seen with rapamycin. So here's the thing, it's becoming more evident now that there's not going to be some one-size-fits-all aging drug. These drugs will have effects specific to age, sex, and species. Not all drugs that work in mice will work in people, and not all drugs used by people will extend lifespan in mice. And here's another thing, how do we know that drugs can beat out diet and exercise? It's common knowledge at this point that diet and exercise are crucial for human well-being. In one matter of view, 
regular exercise was linked to lowering all-cause mortality by 30%, and in another, switching from a bad diet to a good one was correlated with adding up to 10 years of healthy life. But we already know that. Diet fads, sleep hacks, exercise, we've known about these things forever. Lifting weights and eating veggies will only get you so far. There's no one in history who's lived to 150 just by doing those things. Don't believe me? Check Wikipedia. It's right there. As we keep discovering these drugs, we're learning that they're doing things differently than diet and exercise that extend lifespan. A study from the University of Basel found that caloric restriction, a dieting technique shown to extend lifespan in mice, and rabamycin uniquely changed things at the molecular level in genes, in RNA, in proteins, so on and so forth. Our thesis is that developing drugs and therapies, specifically for aging, opens up doors that we didn't think were possible before. I mean, who would have thought that with one mutation, IDG1 lived up to one and a half times longer? And I want to make something clear. His longevity is not just an anomaly. It's not just a fun fact to tell at the dinner table or a throwaway line in a textbook. It's a hint. A hint from nature that lifespan isn't some fixed trait of living things. A hint that it's malleable with medicine. A hint from our very genes that there might be other secrets for giving us all more time.